Will the guests please be seated? Mr. President, honored veterans, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to welcome you aboard the George Washington. We have come together to dedicate this memorial service in honor and remembrance of those brave souls who were lost at sea 50 years ago today. We will now have the invocation. Let us pray. God, our Father and Lord of us all, keep us ever mindful of your eternal presence. We ask you this morning for continued improvement in the weather. Help us to be deeply aware of the meaning of these days of commemoration. We come to this memorial with feelings of sadness yet filled with admiration for the deeds of those who have gone before us. Let us never forget their bravery and the sacrifices they made so that we might enjoy freedom. Help us to de rededicate our lives to their memory. Give your healing to those who mourn, your strength to those who struggle. Guide us and protect us in our continued efforts to preserve freedom, protect human rights, and promote peace in our world. In your name we pray, amen. It is my pleasure to introduce you to a Navy veteran and fellow Naval Academy classmate who served at sea aboard the submarines Blue Back and John C. Calhoun. Now he is serving his country once again as the Secretary of the Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable John H. Dalton. Thank you, Al, and I want to thank you and the outstanding shipmates for the fine job that you're doing. Mr. President, our entire Naval Service is thrilled to have you and the First Lady aboard the George Washington on this special day. Fifty years ago, Allied vessels brimming with determined warriors, uncertain of their fate, but clear in their purpose, sailed across these very waters. Today, we honor them. They made the ultimate sacrifice then so we can be free now. The Allied invasion plan was bold, joint, and dependent on the element of surprise. It was a day in which the, this, this plan the Navy and Coast Guard's mission that day was to drive the Allied sword through the heart of the embattled Nazi wall and safeguard the assault from close ashore. It was a daunting task in the face of a fearsome enemy. Sailing across rough seas, the first Allied wave to approach Omaha Beach included 14 teams of U.S. Navy frogmen. Their mission, to breach the enemy's first line of defense. Their fate, to lose half their number that day. Their reward, to know that they created the five broad channels through which the liberators of Europe would pass. Wave after wave of brave American soldiers crashed through these hard-fought channels to reach Omaha Beach. At the same time, American, British, Canadian, and other Allied troops stormed the rest of the Normandy coastline. The ceiling of clouds disrupted the Allies' aerial bombardment, 
and the rough waters swamped the small craft bearing the Army's artillery. But the weather could do nothing to stop the roar of the guns from the mighty Allied ships of war. The destroyers, some so close to the shore that their keels were scraping the sandy bottom, fired relentlessly at their targets. Sadly, two of them, USS Corey and USS Meredith, rest eternally under the seas on which we now sail. By the end of the day, the wall of tyranny had been breached, but the price had been high. More than 2,000 men were killed or wounded that day, ensuring that democracy would be the hope of future generations. That night, after setting up headquarters on the beach, General Giroux sent a message back to General Bradley aboard USS Augusta. The message was brief, insightful, and still rings so true today. It said, thank God for the United States Navy. On behalf of the Department of the Navy, I welcome all our honored guests to the commemoration of the Allied invasion of Normandy. I am now pleased to introduce Dean Rockwell, who was awarded the Navy Cross for his historic, his heroic actions. He was a group commander of landing craft laden with Sherman tanks on this historic day 50 years ago. By ordering his group to nose directly onto the beach, then Lieutenant J.G. Rockwell saved the lives of hundreds of men whose tanks might otherwise have been swamped by the rough seas. Please welcome a true hero of Normandy, Dean Rockwell. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, Mr. President, Mrs. Clinton, honored guests, we of the U.S. Navy welcome you today as our Commander-in-Chief. You are a member of each of our country's armed forces, but this morning we of the Navy have you to ourselves. Thank you, Mr. President. President Clinton, it was at this same, about this same spot off Omaha Beach 50 years ago today, almost to the hour. I first saw the shore of Normandy through the murk and gloom of a stormy June morning, and it's remarkably the same again today, 50 years later. We are now here to rededicate ourselves to the contributions made by the men and women of the U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine, Marines, with the aid and support of the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force. It was an awe-inspiring armada of over 6,000 ships and naval craft that carried the men and material to the French shore. I was fortunate to have had a small but important part in both the preparation of and the landing at Omaha Beach so did have some perception of the scope of the exercise called Neptune. But it was not until early p afternoon of June the 5th, when we were on our way to Normandy, uh, that the magnitude of the event hit me. The American invasion forces of, to Omaha and Utah Beach had been traveling east in the lee and the, of the shores of England, and as we approached the Isle of Wight, we were joined by the other forces headed for Gold Sword and Juno beaches where the Canadian and English forces were landing. We came to the Isle of Wight. Our force, the American force, turned right. The Canadian and English force turned left. The two columns traveled south parallel toward France. 
It was a dreary day with rain, low clouds, a rough sea, and only short range visibility. Suddenly, about 2 p.m., the clouds parted and the sun appeared briefly, but long enough for me to see ships, 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 all the way to the horizon. At that moment, the scope and magnitude and objective of the exercise hit me, and the die was cast. I knew there was no turning back at that stage. Today, we have the opportunity, yes, the responsibility, to remind the whole world that one half century ago, Americans spearheaded a military invasion whose magnitude had never been done before and is unlikely to be ever to be equal. And tens, yes, hundreds of thousands of men and women took part. Many, many, many gave their lives to bring freedom to the people of Europe and to all, and to enable all humanity, humanity to live in freedom. It is of the utmost importance, Mr. President, that we commemorate this date and event and not forget that what was done. We have a debt and an obligation to those 9,386 Americans who lie under the white pentelic crosses and uh, stars of David and the cemetery above Omaha Beach who paid the supreme sacrifice that we might be free and here today. We are, Mr. President, honored and delighted that you have joined us here today. It is now my privilege and honor to introduce you to the other World War II veterans who have come for this special occasion. Mr. President. Captain Sprigg, chaplains, distinguished leaders of the Congress, the Cabinet, members of the Armed Services, veterans, family, and friends. This new and historically accurate dawn reminds us of that dawn 50 years ago that brought a new era, when thousands of warships assembled to begin Europe's liberation. Allied naval guns unleashed a storm of fire on Normandy's beaches as the sky brightened to a cold gray. Legions of young men packed into landing craft set out to take those beaches. After more than a year of brilliant planning by General Eisenhower and his allied staff and those who were here even before, and one agonizing weather-caused delay, D-Day arrived at last exactly 50 years ago this day. We gather in the calm after sunrise today to remember that fateful morning, the pivot point of the war perhaps the pivot point of the 20th century. But we should never forget that at this hour on June 6, 1944, victory seemed far from certain. The weather was menacing, the seas were churning, the enemy was dug in. Though the plans had been prepared in great detail, the chaos of battle can overwhelm the best laid plans, and for some of our units, the plans went awry. Indeed, General Eisenhower had already drafted a statement in case the operation did not succeed. As H. Hour approached, everyone in the invasion was forced to prepare in his own way. We know now from the records then that some soldiers and sailors woke to their wives back home or to children they had never even held. Some played dice, hoping for a string of good luck. Others tried to read and Many simply prayed. One Jewish officer, Captain Irving Gray, asked the chaplain on his landing craft to lead a prayer. To the God in whom we all believe, whether Protestant or Catholic or Jew, that our mission might be accomplished and that we may be brought safely home again. Back home, as news of the invasion reached our fellow Americans, Americans spoke softly to God. In one Brooklyn shipyard, welders knelt down on the decks of their Liberty ship and said together the Lord's Prayer. The soldiers who landed on Utah and Omaha needed those prayers, for they entered a scene of terrible carnage. Thousands would 
never return. For those who did, it was faith in their Maker's mercy and their own ability that helped to carry the day. It was also raw courage and love of freedom and country. One of the most stirring tales of D-Day is that to which the Secretary of the Navy has already referred, the tale of the USS Corey. Ripped by mines while blasting enemy positions on Utah Beach, the Corey began to go under. But one man stayed aboard. He climbed the stern, removed the flag, and swam and scrambled to the main mast. There he ran up the flag. And as he swam off, our flag opened into the breeze. In the Corey's destruction, there was no defeat. Today, the wreckage of that ship lies directly beneath us, an unseen monument to those who helped to win this great war. Thirteen of the Corey's crew rest there as well, and these waters are forever sanctified by their sacrifice. Fifty years ago, General Eisenhower concluded his order of the day with these words. Let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. As we begin this new day of remembrance, let us also ask God's blessing for all those who died for freedom 50 years ago and for the Americans who carry on their noble work today. May God bless them and may God bless America. Joining the President and Mr. Rockwell are four distinguished veterans. Vice Admiral John Buckley, United States Navy, recipient of the Medal of Honor. <laughs> Rear Admiral Thomas Patterson, United States Merchant Marine. Mr. Fred Schodisch, United States Coast Guard. And Mr. Sidney Sisselman, United States Navy. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we dedicate this wreath and honor all whose sacrifice made possible our liberties and freed the world from tyrant strife. Their gift to every one of us is something that we can't repay, and yet we live the better for their service each and every day. This offering helps us remember those who stormed the Norman beach to challenge Hitler's well-placed troops with guns that had much longer reach the weather was a dismal help, and many soldiers died at sea, while others landing found live fire would leave them dead in Normandy. But though the enemy was strong, and fog and wind and barbed wire, tried untried allies, fest trained troops, untested by such intense fire, yet they prevailed with many lost, 
Against such overwhelming odds, they knelt in prayer to you, great God, to give them victory or gods of armored tanks and hardened bunkers, mortar shells and crack shot snipers, and gods whose false power threatened to wreak death and hell like poisoned vipers. You heard their cries. You heeded pleas. You gave them strength to undergo such strife. They felt the courage you could give from whom all blessings flow. We are still blessed from their great gift, their ultimate in price to pay. That's why we ask of you in prayer remembrance for their lives that day. Almighty God, please bless this wreath and all those listening as we pray. Make worldly leaders and mankind alert to do your will all way. Amen. The wreath will now be placed into the sea. Would you pray with me, ladies and gentlemen? Oh Lord, D-Day was the boldest invasion ever attempted by an army from an armada that the world has not seen before or since. On this day, 50 years ago, thousands of our fellow soldiers died. We give you thanks for the legacy that our comrades in arms left us. We ask your help to build upon that foundation to develop a better tomorrow for those who come after us. Direct our paths to acknowledge you and keep your light burning. We beseech your divine guidance to be more effective for you and each other. This is our prayer in your holy name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the Sunrise Memorial Service. Thank you for being here and joining with us today on this memorable occasion. Please join us in the hangar bay for refreshments. <laughs>